Did you know that the last dynasty to rule Egypt wasn't Egyptian? Hello and welcome to World History Encyclopedia. My name is Kelly and today's video is all about the Ptolemaic dynasty in ancient Egypt. Don't forget the easiest way to support us is by giving this video a thumbs up, subscribing to our channel and hitting that bell icon for notifications so you don't miss out on any new uploads. World History Encyclopedia is a non-profit organization and you can find us on Patreon, a brilliant site where you can support our work and receive exclusive benefits in return. Your support helps us create videos twice a week. So make sure to check it out via the pop-up in the top corner of the screen or via the Patreon link down below. When Alexander the Great of Macedon died unexpectedly in 323 BCE, he had amassed an enormous empire spanning from Egypt through Anatolia, Mesopotamia, and parts of India. The issue is, when Alexander died, he hadn't named a successor or heir to his empire, and instead left it to Crateros, which could have either meant the person Crateros, or to the best, or the strongest. So after his death, Alexander's empire looked like this. Crateros and Perdiccas as regents, Ptolemy as satrap of Egypt, Antipater as satrap of Macedonia, Antigonus as satrap of most of Asia Minor, Lysimachus as satrap of Thrace, Eumenes as satrap of Northern Asia Minor, and Leonatus as satrap of Phrygia. These men who split up Alexander's empire were known as the Diadochi, or successors. After the death of Crateros and the murder of Perdiccas, and the death of Alexander's remaining family, Seleucus became the satrap of Babylon. Eventually, the satrapy period ends and the Hellenistic period begins with Seleucus, Antigonus, Ptolemy, Demetrius, and Lysimachus all making themselves kings of their regions. If you want to know more about Alexander the Great and his empire, you can check out our video all about him. But now, let's follow Ptolemy to Egypt. Ptolemy I Sota, meaning saviour, was a Macedonian general of Alexander. They had been childhood friends and were perhaps even half-brothers or related in some way, but we're not really sure. And after the death of his friend, he was allotted Egypt as his region to rule over, and he couldn't have been more thrilled. Prior to Alexander's conquest, Egypt was under the control of the Persians, who, according to Herodotus, had been intolerant of the ancient Egyptian religion and customs, so they had welcomed Alexander when he came through and pushed Persia out. Alexander embraced the Egyptian gods, he prayed at their temples, and even built a temple to their mother goddess, Isis. Ptolemy wanted rule of Egypt because of the region's wealth and land and the ease with which it could be defended. Although Egypt had been given to Ptolemy to rule, Perdiccas, the self-proclaimed successor to Alexander, didn't trust him, and so he sent Cleomenes of Naucratis, who was the Egyptian finance minister for Alexander, with Ptolemy as a poorly disguised spy. Ptolemy knew he was a spy, and so he accused Cleomenes of fiscal malfeasance and had him executed. Ptolemy could now rule alone with no one breathing down his back, and during his reign he participated in a few wars with the other Diadochi, and even stole the body of Alexander as it was en route to Macedon, and instead buried him in a golden tomb in Alexandria, which has not been found to this day. Before we get into the family shrub that is the Ptolemies, let's take a look at what Egypt looked like under their rule. The Ptolemaic dynasty began under the rule of Ptolemy, whose goal was to make Egypt great again. And he did that by putting the country back on solid economic and administrative footing. He didn't actively try to expand the borders of Egypt, but he did seize opportunities that arose. And that included occupying Cyprus in circa 318 BCE. In order to stay away from the influence of the priests and officials at Memphis, Ptolemy I moved the capital from its traditional place at Memphis to Alexandria. Alexandria, a city established by Alexander the Great, grew and flourished under the Ptolemies. The city became more of a Greek city than an Egyptian one. And with the port giving easy access to the sea and Greece, and with Greek becoming the language of both commerce and government. 
Alexandria was established as a great intellectual centre of the ancient world, and it was Ptolemy I that founded the Great Library of Alexandria with the goal to gather every single text. According to ancient sources, the Library of Alexandria held up to 500,000 scrolls, and it's said that Ptolemy had all texts seized when people arrived at the city, and would often give back copies rather than the original seized text. Ptolemy still respected the Egyptian priests and rebuilt temples destroyed by the Persians. He also established the cult of Alexander, and he introduced a new god, Serapis, the god of healing. Ptolemy I began the construction of the Pharos, or Lighthouse, which was completed by his son, Ptolemy II. And the Lighthouse of Alexandria became one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. The economy of the Ptolemies was one of the most closely controlled in history. Most of the land was royal land, and you needed permission to plant trees just as much as you needed it to cut them down. Ptolemy II introduced new revenue and property laws and taxes to the already existing administrative process of Egypt. But radical changes made by the Ptolemies included the cultivation of new crops, growth in international trade, and the production of the first official Egyptian coinage. Although in the 4th century the economy became an absolute powerhouse in the Mediterranean, after the first two Ptolemies it slowly declined with corrupt bureaucracy, droughts and political unrest, until Cleopatra VII was handed a kingdom with its economy in shreds. Ultimately, after paying Rome money her father owed and introducing denominations of Egyptian money, Cleopatra ended up stabilising the economy of Egypt prior to its downfall to Rome. Other than finishing the Lighthouse of Alexandria, Ptolemy II expanded Egypt by reclaiming the city of Cyrene, as well as regions in Syria and Asia Minor. He fought two wars, known as the Syrian Wars, against Antiochus I and II, and he battled in the failed Cremonidian War against Macedon. He expanded Egypt's trade by establishing trading posts along the Red Sea, and enlarged the Library and Museum of Alexandria. Overall, Ptolemy I and II strengthened Egypt, both internally and externally. But this did not continue under any of their descendants until the last queen of Egypt, Cleopatra VII. She was the only one of her family to actually learn the Egyptian language, which meant she had no need of a translator, and could communicate diplomatically without a middleman. Cleopatra often made decisions and acted upon them without consulting the council members of her court, which they did not appreciate. And during her 22 years on the throne, she maintained a state of balance and harmony in Egypt. A thing to note about the Ptolemies, although they were pharaohs of Egypt, they didn't learn the Egyptian language and pretty much just stayed in Alexandria, which they had made the new capital after moving it from the traditional capital of Memphis. They used Greek for all of their administrative documents and married within their own family to keep the bloodline pure and also to keep their wealth in the family. This practice of intermarrying ended up becoming incredibly messy and honestly pretty gross, but we'll get to that. Ptolemy I Sota, who lived between 366 and 282 BCE as king of Egypt, married Berenike I and they had two children. Ptolemy II Philadelphus, meaning sister-loving, and Arsinoe II. Ptolemy II Philadelphus, who lived between 308 and 246 BCE, and is considered the last truly great pharaoh of Egypt, married Arsinoe I, who was the daughter of Lysimachus, who was the Thracian king, and they had a son, Ptolemy III Ergetes, or Benefactor, who lived between 284 and 221 BCE. For alliance's sake, Lysimachus married Ptolemy's sister, Arsinoe II, which ended up being a pretty bad move since Arsinoe II ended up somehow convincing Lysimachus to kill his oldest son and heir from his first marriage. After the death of Lysimachus, Arsinoe II came back to Egypt and then married her full brother, Ptolemy II. This was accepted pretty easily by the Egyptians, but not the Macedonian Greeks, who weren't too thrilled with the marriage. In a way to legitimise their marriage, they likened it to that of Isis and Osiris and Zeus and Hera, both mythological instances of full sibling marriages. Arsinoe II then adopted the title Philadelphus, or brother-loving. Very fitting. 
Are you with me so far? Because it's just going to get more confusing. Okay, so we currently have Ptolemy III Ergetes on the throne after the death of Ptolemy II Philadelphus in 246 BCE. Ptolemy III married Berenike II, who was the granddaughter of Ptolemy I's wife Berenike I, with a Macedonian man named Philip. So Ptolemy III Ergetes and Berenike II had two kids. Yep, you guessed it, a Ptolemy and an us in a way. So Ptolemy IV Philopator, meaning father-loving, who lived between 244 and 205, and his full sister, Asinoe III, got married in 217 BCE. But they were murdered in a coup in 205 BCE, leaving their only son, Ptolemy V Epiphanes, meaning made manifest. Since his parents died suddenly, Ptolemy V, who lived between 210 and 180 BCE, inherited the throne as a young boy, and in 193 BCE, he married the Seleucid princess Cleopatra I. No, not that Cleopatra. We'll get to her later. One thing to note about Ptolemy V is that the famous Rosetta Stone, aka the reason why we can read hieroglyphics, was actually inscribed with a whole lot of praise for Ptolemy V. How he bought great prosperity to Egypt. He spent a lot of money on temples, built and restored buildings, and gave people grain. This declaration was to be written in three languages, Demotic, Greek, and Hieroglyphs, and put up in all the temples. Okay, back to the family. So Ptolemy V Epiphanes and Cleopatra I had three children, Ptolemy VI Philometor, Cleopatra II, and Ptolemy VIII Ergetes II, whose nickname was Physcon, or Fatty, we can only assume he didn't choose that nickname for himself. During Ptolemy V's reign, he had to deal with the Macedonian and Seleucid kings revolting in the hopes that they could seize some of Egypt's land. And after the Battle of Panium in 200 BCE, Egypt lost territory in the Aegean and Asia Minor. Ptolemy V was succeeded by his son, Ptolemy VI Philometor, meaning mother-loving, who lived between 186 and 145 BCE, with his early reign being a co-ruler with his mother, Cleopatra I, until her unexpected death in 176 BCE. During his reign, Egypt was invaded twice by Antiochus IV, but with the help of Rome, Ptolemy VI kept his hold on Egypt, but his entire reign was tumultuous. And this is where it starts to get really messy and honestly, pretty gross. So Ptolemy VI married his full sister, as they were now very comfortable doing, Cleopatra II, and they had two kids, Cleopatra III and another Ptolemy, Ptolemy VII, Neos Philopator, meaning the new beloved of his father. But we don't really know much about Ptolemy VII or if he was ever king, so we'll just leave it at that. After Ptolemy VI Philometor died, his brother Ptolemy VIII Euergetes II, or Fatty, who lived between circa 184 and 116, married his brother's widow, who was also his sister, Cleopatra II, and then replaced her with his niece and also stepdaughter, Cleopatra III. Yeah, I'll let that one sink in for a second. The uncle-niece marriage of Ptolemy VIII and Cleopatra III resulted in four children, and yes, they were all named either Ptolemy or Cleopatra. Their children were Cleopatra IV, Ptolemy IX, Sota II, Cleopatra V, Selene, and Ptolemy X, Alexander I. Ptolemy VIII was succeeded by his son, Ptolemy IX, Sota II, nicknamed Lathyrus, or Chickpea. He married his sister Cleopatra IV, and they had a son. Ptolemy XII Neos Dionysus, also known as Oletes. And he married his other sister, Cleopatra Selene, and together they had a daughter, Berenike III. At this point, the reigns were all pretty short, and these pharaohs didn't really have much of an impact on Egypt at all. This is also the time when Rome started to rise in power in the West. Ptolemy X Alexander I eventually replaced his brother and also married their sister, Cleopatra Selene, and together they had Ptolemy XI Alexander II. In this little messed up generation, the daughter of Ptolemy IX and Cleopatra Selene, Berenike III, married her half-brother Ptolemy XI and also her uncle Ptolemy X. Berenike and Ptolemy X had a daughter, Cleopatra V, who, with her sort of uncle-cousin, had Cleopatra VI, Arsinoe IV, Berenike IV, Ptolemy XIII, Theos Philopator, Cleopatra VII, yes, that Cleopatra, and Ptolemy XIV. 
It is at this point that I want to draw to attention the fact that Cleopatra VII and her siblings all only had one set of great-grandparents. That's how inbred and messed up their family tree became. How Cleopatra VII became such an educated, diplomatic and intelligent woman with the genetic odds stacked against her like this is a miracle. Although she is now mostly remembered as the woman who had love affairs with both Julius Caesar and Mark Antony, she was also fluent in numerous languages, including Egyptian, and successfully steered Egypt through a difficult period prior to meeting either of the men she is famously known for. If you want to know more about Cleopatra VII, make sure to check out our video all about her. Cleopatra married both of her brothers, her younger one just in name only, but had a child with Julius Caesar, Ptolemy XV, who is better known as Caesarian, and she had three children with Mark Antony, Alexander Helios, Ptolemy Philadelphus, and Cleopatra Selene II. After Mark Antony and Cleopatra VII lost at the Battle of Actium against Octavian, who would become Augustus Caesar, first emperor of Rome, Antony and Cleopatra both committed suicide. Cleopatra's son to Julius Caesar, Caesarian, was killed, and Antony and Cleopatra's three kids were sent to be raised by Octavia, the sister of Octavian, essentially putting an end to the Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt. Looking at the Ptolemies today, it's easy to think that they were a little inbred and out of touch with their people. They didn't even speak Egyptian. But how different is this from today though? In many countries, the leading class is very exclusive and removed from the people. Let us know what you think in the comments below. If you enjoyed this video, make sure to give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss out on our new videos every Tuesday and Friday. This video was brought to you by World History Encyclopedia. For more great articles and interactive content, head to our website via the link below. If you like my shirt, you can find this design and a bunch more on our shop at worldhistory.store, or you can find a link for it under the merch tab down below. Thank you so much for watching and we'll see you soon with another video.